talk complete this encryption with FreeBSD. Um, those who have taken a look at the schedule probably know that tomorrow there's also a talk on disk encryption, but um, in contrary to that, I'm not going to talk about legal issues or um, give an overview over what's available um, with tools, operating systems, or whatever. The goal here is to work. And the focus obviously is on complete disk encryption. So um, just to get a picture of the audience, who is using a BSD operating system in here? Um, and who has experience with Unix in general? So you guys all use Linux, right? <coughs> well, there's a, a few differences bet between BSD and Linux and probably a little a bit elaborate than that. Um, before I jump all into the gory details of the implementation, I would like to give uh, um, a bit of background and motivation why we would like to do this. So um, I would like to start with the most basic question, basically why would we like to use in-storage encryption? Now, instead of asking rhetorical questions here, I would like to make my point by um, using some quotes of news articles I've collected over the time. You can read them for yourself. Can you read the news articles? Should I read them out? That's better? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm sure you will find scary ones on the net, but just give you a picture. So um, what's interesting about this um, news? Well, what they have in common is basically it doesn't really matter whether the firewall was properly configured, if they had an antivirus software, um, whether they used the Redmond operating system or not, it basically doesn't matter because the attacker had the physical access to the medium, in that case the hard disk, the tape or whatever. So how do we solve this? Well, it's basically easy. We just encrypt the data in storage while it's on the hard disk, not in transmission. Well, there's basically two ways to do that. One is file-based encryption and one is partition-based encryption. File-based encryption, as um, the name implies, you can decide for each file individually whether you want to encrypt it or not and how. Um, tools of this, I'm sure you know PGP or GNU PG. Encrypt is, maybe you know it, maybe you don't. Well, the advantages of file-based encryption. Well, basically, you can save um, CPU time on the stuff that you think is not really necessary, the effort. If you have a 600 megabyte free BSD image, well, you can discuss whether it's worth encrypting it or not. <coughs> there is also the advantage of having different keys for different files, although reality shows, shows somewhat the opposite behavior. Um, drawbacks, metadata is not encrypted, it means stuff like file name, size, ownership, and all this stuff that's encrypted in the file system, um, that's stored in the file system is not encrypted with file-based encryption. File -based encryption. So um, if you're being investigated and someone finds uh, a file extortion letter on your hard disk, then maybe it doesn't really matter what's stored in the file, even if it's encrypted, the file name already t tells a lot. And there is also some, something that I call the leakage risk. So what is it? Well, the story goes as follows. You know that it's a risk to um, store your files not encrypted. So what you do is use either file-based encryption or partition-based encryption. Let's assume that you encrypt the whole partition. I'm coming to that later. Just let's assume you have an encrypted partition. You put all your stuff on there. Well, you might think it's safe because it's encrypted, but the problems basically start 
when you open a file, for example, a text document with, um, well, quite complex applications such as OpenOffice. But the problem is a lot of these applications, they store um, temporary data. So you might have a temporary copy in the temp directory of the actual file that's encrypted. But the problem is, if you don't have the temp directory encrypted, then even if the file itself is encrypted on the partition, it leaks to the unencrypted temp directory. So even if the file is deleted afterwards, it still resides physically on the medium until it's overwritten. That's the problem. And also the swap partition, which is by default not encrypted, represents a risk because, well, you probably would be surprised how much interesting stuff you can find on there. Well, the leakage risk, um, to summarize it, your encrypted data is leaked to an unencrypted part of the medium. If, for example, the temp directory, the war temp, is on an unencrypted part of the partition and an application stores a temporary copy in there, then, well, it's a problem. So implications, file-based encryption, it becomes basically useless. So, um, using PGP or GNU PG to encrypt your stuff, it's, it doesn't really um, give you a lot of advantage because a lot of the stuff just leaks to an unencrypted part of the medium. Well, there is another way to do it, file um, partition-based encryption, where you basically take a whole partition and, <coughs> and encrypt it. An advantage there is that the metadata such as file names, size, and stuff like that is encrypted. And all of the data you put there is also encrypted by default, so you don't have to um, select for each file, encrypt this, um, leave that unencrypted, encrypt this. And basically it is reduces a lot of the leakage risk, but the problem is the <coughs> leakage risk is still existent. The main problem basically is um, what ac does ac actually go onto the encrypted partition, what does not, it's not so easy to tell. But um, we have a far more serious problem than the leakage risk. Because um, so far we have assumed that the applications and the operat operating system itself are stored unencrypted on the hard disk. I mean, it doesn't make any sense to so the operating system and the applic applications encrypted, but the data not, so let's go on. Well, I'm not saying complete disk encryption should be used by everybody here because there's a lot of trade-offs and what you have to ask yourself is, how secure do you consider your data and pro program code to, from unauthorized access to be in? For example, a hotel room, your office, your parked car. How many people in here feel comfortable with um, leaving their laptop in their hotel room? <laughs> well, <laughs> all right. <laughs> well, the conclusion basically is, unless you keep a notebook inside at all times, you don't really have a guarantee that someone hasn't compromised either the oper operating system or some critical applications, and so on. Well, what is the solution? We encrypt the operating system and the applications as well. But there's the next problem. If you encrypt everything, and I mean everything, kernel, boot code, and the whole stuff, then we have a problem because today's computers, they can't boot encrypted code. You can't have an encrypted MBR with partition table and so on, it doesn't work. So um, to sum it up, um, we have to, ha to load the operating system from a non-encrypted medium, but we can't do it from the hard disk because it is too risky. I mean, you can't um, remove the hard disk each time fr from the laptop you want to leave it in a place. So. Um, what we're going to do is basically, because we have to store the operating system at least core parts such as boot code and kernel on an unencrypted medium, is that we use a medium that we carry with ourselves at all times. 
So the best solution is basically to use a USB memory stick because they are really small and light and they also have a lot of space, at least for what we need it for. <coughs> and also they are rewritable many times and the operating system recognizes them as a hard disk, basically. You can use alternative media such as CD-ROM, for example, these small eight centimeter disks. They are um, a bit harder to carry around, but they work. You don't need um, read-write access for operation. Of course, you have to master the medium, but if you use it, you just have to read it out. So um, actual implementation. What do you need? Well, you need a bootable and a removable medium. That's very important. Removable because you have to um, remove it from uh, the laptop and carry it with you at all times. And of course, it has to be bootable because the operating system is going to be booted from there. Minimum size, well, that's really not a lot. About five megabytes should do it, but really that's the absolute minimum. If you want um, more kernel modules and stuff like that, I'm going to elaborate on that later, then about 20 or 25 megabytes should do it. And as the title says, the whole thing is going to be based on FreeBSD. You probably can do it on other operating systems, but here I'm going to focus on FreeBSD. So what you need is a FreeBSD 5 or 6. You can't do it with 4 because um, the functionality is not there. Also what's needed is you already need a uh, running FreeBSD system, 5X or later. Um, the FreeBSD installation disk, they have a so-called Fixit live file system on that, which you can boot from CD and basically you get a whole FreeBSD system running without even having to install anything. If you want a graphical environment, you can take a look at FreeSD. That's really, you can boot it from CD and you have a complete graphical environment with basically everything you need. And of course, um, the machine, the notebook or whatever has to be capable of booting from the medium here. Um, if you use a USB memory stick, it might be a problem with older machines, but bootable CD-ROMs should probably work on most machines. So um, those who are not so familiar with FreeBSD, just uh, overview over the namespace. We have um, the device nodes in slash tail. You probably, that's not something new. Um, ATA hard disks, AD, SCSI hard disks, DA, um, and so on. If you need more information, please take a look at the main pages in section four, such as DA4. And if you want to get an overview over um, the devices the kernel has recognized, you can take a look at this file here. Um, yeah. Well, in FreeBSD and the other BSDs as well, there is a difference to Linux because what we call a partition in PC terminology is actually called a slice in FreeBSD. And this so-called slice can be further partitioned inside. So what in PC terminology might be the primary partition is a slice in FreeBSD, and this primary partition can further be partitioned into, um, for example, boot partition, swap partition, and other partitions. So you can have the swap partition, the boot partition, and up to um, another seven, um, in total seven partitions inside a slice. Um, if you take, for example, an ATA disk, that's AD and starts with zero, then you have um, the first partition in PC terminology is the slice, S1, and then you have the boot partition, which is um, agreed on the letter A, swap partition is B, and so on. So DA1, S3B is the second SCSI disk, um, on which we have um, the third slice, and B is the swap partition. Um, if you're not familiar with that, um, please read the stuff carefully bef before you start typing in stuff. Otherwise, you will erase the wrong hard disk, delete the slice, which is not supposed to be deleted, and so on. So um, if you're not familiar with FreeBSD, please check this out carefully. 
that's just an overview. And also the usual disclaimer, please back up all the data before you store. So I don't want to be responsible for any damages. I mean, the whole point is that we erase the entire hard disk and set it up new. Well, the assumptions, I will assume that you have an ATA disk in your hard disk that's going to be AD0 and the removable USB medium that attaches what USB bus as a UMAS, as a USB mass storage medium and the free BSD trips like um, the SCSI hard disk and that's DA0. So you have AD0 and DA0. So please um, check twice before you hit the answers. And you also have to adjust them if, for example, use um, the second ATA disk, which is going to be AD1. Don't type AD0 if you want AD1. Okay, um, before we start, um, the whole thing is basically pointless. If you um, just erase your files on there, set up um, the encrypted disk, and then the encrypted data is basically um, stored while the unencrypted data is still accessible on the second level of the disk. So what we have to do is basically we have to um, clean the entire hard disk. You can do this in two ways. Either you can overwrite the whole hard disk with zero values or with entropy. Well, zero values, it's obviously the fastest, but the problem is if you write zero values over the whole hard disk, then it's immediately clear which parts of the disks are data and which ones are unused. So um, people who look for potential clues about the keys might exploit this fact. But um, in most cases, it's probably not a major risk, so you have to evaluate, do I want more security, or is the machine really too slow to generate so much entropy? If you want entropy, then use device random. So um, if you want to do complete disk encryption, you have basically two tools in FreeBSD. One is GVD, Geom-based disk encryption, and the other one is Scaly. GVD was released in 5.0 and Scaly in 6.0. And there is a lot of interesting, um, basically, improvements in Scaly because you have different ciphers, AES, Blowfish, Triple DES. You also have a variable key length. I think the maximum is 256 bits. In GVD, you only have AES 128 bits. And basically, um, the most important difference between GVD and Chaley is that Chaley allows the kernel to mount an encrypted root partition. GVD does not, allo does not allow to do this. So we have to take a detour to make the whole thing work. But explaining this will also show you some interesting aspects in the booting pro process and how this stuff can be solved. So I don't know whether we have enough time to discuss both, but I will start with GVD. The solution one is to have a non-encrypted root file system. Please note that this is not, um, this doesn't, um, in contrary to complete disk encryption because the root file system does not have to be on the hard disk. Now, um, the solution with having an unencrypted root file system works with both GVD and Chaley, but I'm going to um, take GVD as an example here so we can discuss um, the second solution which only applies to Chaley. And this way you have no viewable over both tools. Well, GPD, it's avail available since 5.0 um, and FreeBSD was, um, the 5X branch was um, declared stable since the 5.3 release. So please use the latest release because um, 5.0 through 5.2 are not really stable, they are development releases. The cipher is 128 bit AES. And a very important feature is basically that GVD does not care what file system you put on there. So you can have basically MS-DOS FS, you can have standard Unix file system or whatever you want. Obviously we're going to use the Unix file system FreeBSD's default here. 
And the passphrase, that's also very important. If you change the passphrase, you don't have to set up a complete thing new. You just change the passphrase and you go on. Um, a lot of file system crypto solutions, they really re require you if you want to change the passphrase you have to basically wipe out the whole partition, set it up new, and well, it's not really feasible to do that. More information you can find in the man pages. Please read them carefully if you really want to um, do some stuff that's not discussed here. Well, now we can start. GPD init, you have to initialize the hard disk first before you can use the whole thing. Here you specify the device, AD0, that's our hard disk and there is the L parameter, and it's used for the so-called log file. I will sh discuss this in short. Then you enter the, the passphrase and confirm it. Now the log file, it's very important that you store this in a safe place, because if it's not available later, the data is lost. So the log file, what is it? It's 16 bytes of data, and it's required to get access to the master key. Um, the log file is not the key, it's just, um, it's just the data you need to get access to the master key, which is then used to encrypt and decrypt all the data. Well, basically, GPD does not force you to, to use a log file. Instead, if you don't specify the L parameter, GPD will just store this 16 bytes in um, the first sector of the medium. But this way, you would only um, you would only need a passphrase to get access to the to the data. Well, since we need a removable device anyway, we can store the log file on the removable medium, and this way, we need to use um, a log file and a passphrase to get access to the data, which is commonly referred to as two-factor authentication. So, if you boot the machine up. You insert a removable medium or attach it. GPD will read out um, the log file data on the removable medium, and you have to enter the passphrase. If the passphrase is not available or the log file is not available, you don't get access to the data, even if you know the passphrase. So um, let's sum up. In order to get access to the plain text, you need obviously the encrypted data itself, the passphrase and the log file. If the log file is lost, even if it's destroyed or lost or whatever, then even if you know the passphrase, you won't get access to the data. Um, the whole design of GPD is quite complex, and if you really want to get a detailed, um, detailed perspective of the whole thing, then I suggest you read Paul Henning Kemp's paper, Gem-based Disk Encryption, which really goes into a lot of details. Now, after you've initialized the whole thing, we can basically um, do what's known as attaching. You have to, each time um, you want to get access to the decrypted data, you have to attach it. GPD attached, and you specify the device. Parameter, this is an L here, not an I. And again, the path of the log file. Then you enter the passphrase. And now wh um, what happens here is really interesting because it's um, an example of good software design in my opinion. Um, what happens is if you enter the correct passphrase and you specify the correct log file, then GPD will create a second device node. The, um, the original device node AD0 still exists and if you access it, will, you will actually see what's on the hard disk, which is the ciphered text, the encrypted data. And the device node ad0.bde is created by GBD, and it's basically um, a pseudo device that gives access to the plain text. And you can treat this device node like the original ad0, so you can format it, partition it, whatever. Now, a warning. After you've attached um, the device node and you have the .bd device node, then you have access to the plain text. It doesn't matter whether it's already mounted or not. Um, you have access to the plain text, 
as soon as you've attached the device. And it remains this way until you either shut the system down or you explicitly detach it. So um, in the time between attaching and detaching the device, there is no additional protection by GVD because you have access to the plain text and the key material is available. So um, please keep this in mind. It doesn't matter whether the encrypted partition is mounted or not. As soon as it's attached, you have access to the plain text. Now, um, slicing and partitioning, usually FreeBSD uses notice, we use sysinstall for that. Unfortunately, sysinstall is quite old and isn't really able to handle these BDE device nodes correctly. So what we have to do is we have to um, manually use the tools in order to um, partition and slice the disk. We can't use sysinstall. Now, since this is complete disk encryption and we are uh, assume that only FreeBSD will be used on the hard disk. We can basically um, skip slicing, which in PC terminology is used as partitioning, and start um, using FreeBSD partitions on the hard disks. So we use BSD label, um, W writes first standard label on it, and with E you can edit it. And please um, notice this is ad0.bde, don't use device um, AD0 because that's the size it takes and if you do that you overwrite um, the initialized hard disk and you have to start new. Um, if you enter um, the E parameter with BSD label then you get an editor and basically you have to specify now um, the partition. A is the boot partition, B is the swap and so on. You just, um, well, you have to consider what's useful for you. Um, the second and the first columns are size and offset, that's in sectors. Then FS type, you can use um, either uh, 4.2 BSD um, for all um, partitions that use a standard UFS file system and the swap partition uses just the swap as the FS type. Um, the stuff here you can just leave, um, the default val values are okay. Um, that's an uh, example of a 100 megabyte disk to keep the numbers a bit down. You have uh, a boot partition, a swap partition, and you have an additional partition D. Um, the C partition is the whole disk, please don't edit anything on the C partition. Now, what's really interesting is um, the device naming. We already know um, access to the plain text data is ad0.bde. Now, um, the boot partition on the encrypted hard disks is now ad0.bde a. The swap partition is b, and so on. Um, in the top part is basically if you first encrypt the hard disks and then you partition it. You can also do it the way around. You can first partition the hard disk and then you basically would have to encrypt each partition individually. Um, in that case, um, the names of the device nodes, they change. If you first partition and then you encrypt, then you have ad0a.bde. So you have to encrypt each partition individually. What we are going to do is we first encrypt the hard disk and then we partition it. Well, the funny thing basically about this is that you can also use um, multiple operating system on the same hard disk. You just have to use um, one slice for each operating system. You can have, on one slice you can have FreeBSD, on the second slice you can have Linux. And the slice where FreeBSD resides is basically you can encrypt the whole thing. So even if you use Linux and you get rooted, the partition on which FreeBSD resides is still completely encrypted, so the attacker won't um, be able to modify the data to anything useful. Um, this is but um, this is a bit out of the scope of um, this lecture, so um, I'm going to really focus on complete disk encryption where we encrypt the whole hard disk.
Now um, we've encrypted the hard disk and we have partitioned it, so we have to devise those. What we have to do now is um, we have to create the file systems. So new file system, device edu0.bde, a boot partition to swap, obviously it doesn't need a file system, d and so on. For each partition you must create the file system. Now, the actual installation of FreeBSD. Usually, would, we would use, again, sysinstall, but sysinstall, again, um, well, gives us the finger and says you can't do that. Um, the reason for that is that um, the BDE device loads are not listed by um, sysinstall, so you can't even select them. So what this means is we have to um, the various distributions that make up the FreeBSD installation, we have to manually install them and also do some post-installation is issues uh, such as um, time zone, keyboard map and stuff like that we have to set up manually. <coughs> well, installing it. Yeah? Well, as we're going to see, it's not that much work, but I agree it should be done a lot easier. The problem is sysinstall is a quite ancient tool in FreeBSD, probably one of the oldest, and it's really, um, well, I'm told that it requires a lot of changes to make it work. And there is also some stuff um, that people want to integrate and which just um, puts a lot of a lot of work to the developers and system is really not up to the task. There is now um, a project that um, that people work on a completely new installer for FreeBSD, so maybe there is some hope. But it, it's not that much work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, if you, is there another question? Backup. But you mean just copy an existing system on the partition? Well, you can do. Well, just let me go on. It's not that much work to um, install the system. Well, if you use the, fi um, the fix it live file system, I assume you have um, distribution of FreeBSD mounted on disk and the encrypted hmm? and the encrypted um, boot partition and fix. So um, the way that um, the FreeBSD installation disks are laid out in the file system is you have um, um, a directory in the root of the CD-ROM which is named after um, the release, for example, 5.4 release, um, 6.0 beta and so on. And in there you have um, um, directories which are named after the distributions such as base, man pages, games, and so on. What you really need is base. You have to install that distribution. Um, actually, um, the installation scripts in, inside um, these distributions, they are really um, programmed smartly. So all you have to do is you have to export an environment variable which is called test here, and you have to set it um, to the location where you have mounted the encrypted boot partition, which is in our case device adu0.bdea, which is mounted on fix. So you just type in this one, change into the directory, um, base is um, the distribution we need, which is mandatory, and then you execute install sh. And this basically installs you the whole, um, all files that are necessary for running a free BSD system. If you need addi additional um, distributions such as man pages and so on, just replace um, the base directory with man pages, games, or whatever, and re execute the install script. It's not that much work. I agree it could be done a lot easier, but um, we just have to lift that um, for now. So, after you've um, installed the dis distributions you want to install, um, 
you basically have, uh, well, a fully functional system on the encrypted hard disk. And the boot partition, um, the boot, the swap partition is also set up. But the problem is now, since everything is encrypted, we can't boot from the hard disk, which is um, what I mentioned at the beginning. So we have to basically set up the removable medium now, which is the USB memory stick, or if you want the CD-ROM image, or whatever. Now, um, the removable medium, since this one is not going to encrypt, you can use this install for that. So just use F disk, and the device here is device DA0, so please again note the difference. Um, size about eight megabytes should do it. If you want all the kernel modules, um, use 25 megabytes or more. But um, with the current memory sticks, it shouldn't really be a problem with the space, so. Um, Now, um, on the removable medium, we do not need a, um, a swap partition because we're going to use the one on the encrypted hard disk. I'm going to assume that um, the file system on the removable <coughs> medium is now mounted on removable. So if you run the whole um, sysinstall process, you create the slice partitions and create the file system. So in order to boot from the removable medium, we basically have to just copy um, the boot directory from the already installed system on the fixed hard disk to the removable medium. So copy um, the whole thing. Fixed is now the hard disk, the encrypted boot, to um, the removable medium. Now um, the kernel modules. Linux also has kernel modules, so um, I assume you're already familiar with that. Um, on FreeBSD, it works as follows. You have basically uh, executable, which is called the loader. You have, um, if you switch on the computer, then the BIOS will read out the master boot record on the hard disk. Then, depending on which slice or partition PC terminology you select, then if you select the FreeBSD slice, then um, the boot code will, um, will read out the disk label. The disk label will read out the loader, and the loader will finally give control to the kernel. So um, the loader executable will, will first read out the file bootloader.conf, which lists the kernel modu modules which have to be loaded um, when the kernel is loaded. The problem is, um, if you use TBD, you can't load um, you can't load the kernel module after you've executed TBD. There is um, a kernel module for TBD and also a user land utility, but you have to load um, the kernel module before you execute um, the user land utility. So you have to just um, add an entry for TBD load into boot loader conf. Now, um, the modules which you don't need, um, you can delete them if space is a problem. Um, one cool thing about um, the FreeBSD booting process is that you basically can gzip everything. You can even gzip the kernel and all the modules and it will still work. The problem is not so much um, the space, but um, the loading time. If you boot from a USB removable medium, then um, even if you have USB 2, um, the protocol here in the, um, that the BIOS speaks is just USB 1, and the loading time is really um, a bit slow, so it's important to really compress um, the whole boot code as much as you can. And one important thing is please do not mix um, different versions on the removable medium and the fixed hard disk. So. If you boot uh, 5.4 kernel from the removable medium, please don't load them um, 6.0 modules from the hard disks or vice versa or whatever. You will get into problems. Now, um, GBD has a problem, and that's it cannot, uh, it doesn't allow the kernel to mount encrypted partitions, root partitions. So the way it works is, if you want to attach an encrypted partition, you have to run 
the GPD user land utility. But, well, the problem, if you run a user land utility, then first init has to be called first process. And init is created by the kernel. But the problem is the root file system is mounted by the kernel before init is created. So we have a typical um, boot process problem. So the only conclusion basically we can make is that we cannot use an encrypted root file system if you use GPD. Now the solution, well, we create a memory disk. And this memory disk we can use as the, um, as the root file system. And on this memory disk, we basically put all the stuff that's necessary to run the GPD user land utility, and then to mount the encrypted partitions in a directory of the memory disk, and then we load the whole stuff off the encrypted hard disk. So that's basically the idea if we um, have to use GPD. Well, the memory disk, just create an image first, about 10 megabytes should do it. Then we need a device node, this is um, FreeBSD specific, I guess. Um, after you have the device node, just um, create the file system on it and then mount it. I will assume that um, the memory disk is now mounted on memdisk, slash memdisk. Now, what you need, since um, the memory disk is going to be mounted as the root file system, you obviously need a directory where we can root the encrypted boot partition. So I will assume that we use um, the directory safe for that. Now, you need additional dire directories which serve as mount points, such as CD-ROM, very important device, disk mount, and ETC. Now, what we need um, on the memory disk on ETC is basically the RC script, and again, here comes the log file. We have to copy the log file from um, the location wherever you started um, at the beginning, now onto the memory disk, because um, the memory disk is going to be rooted as the root file system, and we execute all the stuff on that and provide the log file to GPDE. And also very important, please notice, um, each time you change the passphrase of GPD, the contents of the log files, of the log file changes. So it's going to be 16 bytes, but the content changes. So if you change the passphrase to the encrypted um, hard disk or partition or whatever, then you have to update the log file on the memory disk. Otherwise, you won't have access to your data anymore. Now, after the kernel has booted up, um, loader passes control to the kernel, and the kernel in turn um, executes init, which is the first process. Init in turn calls RC, and the important thing about RC is it's not a binary, binary executable, it's um, a text script which, which we can easily edit. So what we do is basically we modify the <coughs> RC script we add a few commands, um, only the stuff necessary to attach um, the encrypted partition, mount it, and then load all the stuff, basically RC um, will continue loading the whole stuff off the encrypted hard disk since we have attached and mounted it in the RC script. What we need for that is um, GPD binary, mount of course, and some other stuff. Well, all these um, important tools can be found in the so-called rescue directory, which is part of any FreeBSD installation. And the important thing about that is that it's statically linked binaries, so you don't have any dependencies on libraries. If you um, execute GPD binary, then you only have that binary. You don't have dependencies on libraries and whatever. So we can just copy um, the whole rescue directory onto the memory disk. But um, since the whole tools are just hard links, we have to use tar, we can't just copy them onto the memory disk, otherwise we have about 470 megabytes of code, all the same binaries. Now, um, after we've done that, basically we have um, 
the removable medium is now bootable. The loader calls the kernel, kernel calls init, init calls RC, and RC then mounts um, and attaches the encrypted hard disk. But after that, um, the memory disk is still the root file system is, uh, and is always going to be um, until the system is shut down. So what we need um, on the memory disk is basically um, symbolic links pointing from the root on the memory disks to the actual directories on the encrypted hard disk. So we have to just um, create symbolic links to where um, safe the encrypted boot partition is mounted. So for example, um, we have to make sure that um, the SBIN directory, which is now in safe SBIN, has an entry in the root, so um, all applications the kernel finds the files. Now we have to glue the whole thing together. Now I already mentioned that we have to um, modify RC, the RC script, which is on the memory disk. Now you have, um, maybe it's, it changes with um, the release, but in 5.4 release, it's slide 51. You have to insert the following commands. As I already said, we're going to use um, the executables in the rescue directory, gpd attach, um, ad0 device, and then specify the log file. The log file is now on the memory disk. After we've attached the whole thing, we obviously have to mount it, ad0.bdea, is the encrypted boot partition on the hard disk, and we mount this on save, which is a directory on the memory disk. After that, um, this one is 6.0 specific. I don't know why, but for some reason, you have to enforce um, bright access to the memory disk. I don't know why, but it's got to be. Now, after that, we can basically remove the ETC directory from the memory disk. All that's in the EC ETC directory on the memory disk is the log file and the RC script. But of course, you have a lot of other stuff in the ETC directory. So we just link um, the ETC directory on the hard disk to the entry in the root directory on the memory disk. So what basically happens is after the kernel calls init, init calls RC, and these commands are executed, and after we're here, we have um, the encrypted boot partition basically mounted on safe. And since we have symbolic links in the root on the memory disk, all these links point to the actual um, directories on the encrypted disk. So after um, the script has executed here, we can just resume the normal operation, and all um, the rest of um, the booting process is, is loaded from the encrypted hard disk. Now, after we've done that, um, the memory disk is basically, we have all the stuff we need, just unmount it and detach the memory disk. And the image, this is now the image for the memory disk. You can also gzip that and save a lot of space. Now, um, the memory disk image here, this one is going to be on the removable medium, but we have um, to tell the loader executable that it has to load um, the memory disk. Therefore, we have to um, specify an entry in bootloader.conf where we already had um, the GPD module, MFS root load yes, and then all the stuff that's necessary. Especially um, important is the type here. This is not um, uh, an ordinary kernel module, but just a memory disk image, so we have to specify that otherwise the kernel will probably panic or whatever. Now, how does the whole thing work? So we boot from the removable medium. Um, after um, loader is executed, um, it will read out the contents of the boot loader file. In there, we told that um, the GPD kernel model has to be loaded, and um, the memory disk image has to be loaded. Now, now if the, um, after the kernel has booted up and roots 
mounts the root file system, then if you have the MD root option compiled in, then the memory disk image will automatically be mounted as the root file system if you have loaded one. Then we execute init, RC, and the whole stuff attach and mount the encrypt disk, and we can complete the whole booting process. Um, what we need now is um, an entry for the swap partition and the file etcfs tab, you have to do it on the hard disk, not on the removable medium. Once we have um, attached the encrypted hard disk, we don't have to access the removable medium again. We can even remove it from um, the computer. Now, what you've basically now is uh, running FreeBSD system. All you have to do is adjust some stuff, such as the root password, time zone, and so on. The reason for this is that we haven't done the installation with sysinstall, so um, we have to manually adjust this. After that, you can basically add patch packages, such as the X server and whatever you want. Now, um, the second solution is um, with Gaily, but I don't think we have time to do that. Um, if you understand, the first solution, it's basically a lot easier to, um, to also understand this because um, the GPD approach is a lot more complicated. I would just like um, to focus now on some, on some implications which are very important. So now you've got the system, complete disk encryption, and you feel completely safe, right? Well, not exactly. Um, I want to really tell you um, what's protected and what is not. So um, um, how does the whole thing work? Well, I already told you, attach the removable medium, we boot from it, and we use the removable medium because um, we cannot trust um, the unencrypted boot code on the hard disk. We have to boot unencrypted <coughs> code, but for that reason we have to put it on a medium which we can carry on ourselves at all times. So after we've booted from the uh, removable medium, we mount the encrypted hard disk, and the hard disk is encrypted because um, we do not want to look after the whole thing all the time. So basically, after you've booted from the removable medium, you have to really detach it and back in your pocket because um, the whole code is unencrypted on the boot medium, and if someone manages to compromise it, we are back where we started, so the problem hasn't really been solved. So it's really important that you look after the removable medium because the code on there is not encrypted. You have the kernel and a lot of other um, critical code on there that if it gets compromised, we are back where we started. Um, yeah. Now for your own safety, this is very important. Um, Again, you need the passphrase and the log file and obviously the data to get access. So if you're afraid that you um, forget the passphrase, it's very important that you choose a strong one, but if you are, are afraid that you forget it, then please write it down. It's better to um, write it down than to not have access to your data anymore. But please notice that you keep it apart from um, the removable medium and the machine itse itself, so please lock it in a safe place. And also the log file. If it's destroyed or lost or whatever, you don't have access to your data anymore. So if that's, it's certainly a risk. So um, you should make a copy of the log file, but um, you shouldn't put it anywhere near um, the machine or wherever someone has access to, um, to it. Basically, if someone manages to um, get access to the log file, all they need now is um, the machine, they have to steal the laptop, and they have to know the passphrase. Well, the passphrase, um, it's a bit difficult to keep that secret if you have a mobile device. Each time you boot up the machine, you have to type in the passphrase, and if someone manages to look over your shoulder, then, well, it's, I'm just saying, it's very difficult to really keep the passphrase secret on a mobile device. So um, the log file basically gives addi additional protection because we need to access it to the data, so keep the log file safe. So what does complete, complete disk encryption not protect from? 
Well, um, you have the whole hard disk encrypted, but um, the problem is really um, what happens with all the other media. If you have an um, uh, external hard drive attached, then you mount it into um, the whole Unix namespace. And the problem is um, in Unix with the mount facility, you can't, it's hard to tell which me medium actually holds what data. So um, it's very easy to forget, for example, that this directory might be actually an NFS share on a server that's not encrypted with a connection that's not encrypted. So it's very easy that data still leaks actually to a different place than the encrypted hard disk. So always consider that. Now, um, I've already mentioned disk. As soon as um, a partition or a hard disk is attached, it's um, vulnerable. It's, um, you have the whole plain text available, and it also means you can compromise it. You don't have to mount it, it just has to be attached. So as soon as it's attached, it's um, vulnerable to local and remote attacks. Now, as the OS, um, the operating system partition, the boot partition must always be mounted. Um, it's always vulnerable to compromise local and remote. So as soon as you've booted the system up, the, the boot partition on the uh, encrypted hard disk is not really, um, does not really have any additional protection, so please consider that. The main protection you have is when the machine is turned off. So, um, it's also important to consider that you can't really um, prevent data destruction by encrypting it. There is no, um, there is not any protection from data destruction, either accidental or intentional. Now, GBD and Gale, they cannot protect against attacks that are um, aimed at the hardware. So if someone installs a hardware keylogger, then the whole problem, well, you don't have any protection. And I'm not trying to address this because it's a really difficult issue to solve. So what it does protect, well, if um, the hard disk is not yet attached or already has been detached, then the key is not available and the plain text device node is also not available. So even if the system is up and running, but you have an additional partition such as home, for example, you haven't attached it and you haven't mounted it, then the plain text device node does not exist and the data on it can't be um, changed to anything useful. So that's the protection you have, it's not attached. Now also, since the whole hard disk is encrypted, you don't have um, the risk that anything might leak to an unencrypted part. So you don't have to worry about open office leaking your um, secret document to the temp directory or whatever it goes. You also don't have to worry where browser caches are actually stored and how much data there is, so um, you have the whole hard disk really encrypted. And also the swap partition is now encrypted, so um, a lot of critical data you might find in there cannot really be recovered unless you have the key, uh, the passphrase and the log file. And you also cannot simply um, remove the hard disks or the hard disk and read it out on a different system because you have the whole thing encrypted. Now, you have a few trade-offs. Um, performance, obviously, um, decrypting is not a big deal, but encrypting data requires quite a lot of um, CPU cycles. So the problem we have, basically, is that input and output operations, which were previously um, mainly independent independently done of the CPU are now, now um, tightly coupled to um, the CPU power because each um, read and write operation has either to, to be decrypted or encrypted. So um, the maximum performance may not be um, the actual bandwidth of the, the device, but um, the power of the processor. And administrative work, obviously you have to, um, to set up the whole thing. You also have to maintain it. If, a, if you do a system upgrade, you have to do a lot of steps um, that were initially done. You have to repeat them. And there's also the convenience. Um, booting off a removable medium is typically slower than booting off a hard disk. 
and you also have to um, type in the passphrase each time, which may be a bit inconvenient, but it's a trade-off, so you really have to consider, is it worth it? Now, complete disk encryption um, protects against two specific attacks. The one is that you just um, remove the hard disk from uh, the system and install it in a different system and read out the contents. You can't do that anymore if the whole hard disk is encrypted. The problem is, um, another problem is if you have only one part, just the data encrypted, but not um, the operating system and the applications. You can compromise the applications at the operating system in order to leak actually the encrypted data or the encryption key. Now with complete hard disk encryption, you can't do that anymore because the operating system and the applications are now encrypted too, so you don't really have that problem anymore. But really, these two basic um, threats, they are really the only one which complete hard disk encryption protects. You have a lot of other issues that are not solved, so keep that in mind. Well, summing up, yeah. First, um, determine whether um, there is actually a risk to your data. If you just um, use it at home, keep it uh, locked in a safe and use it for um, checking the weather, then you probably don't need to encrypt the whole hard disk. So determine according to your own situation and environment whether it's really necessary to do complete disk encryption. It's very important to um, determine the weakest link. Is the weakest link really that an, encrypt, um, that an attacker has physical access to the hard disk? If the machine is still very vulnerable to network attacks, then it doesn't make a lot of sense to encrypt the whole hard disk. So if you say, yes, it's a problem, someone might have physical access um, to the machine and I don't want to um, leave my data to that risk, you say, um, well, complete disk encryption, I need to do it. Then be aware of the capabilities and limits of the hardware. So is the machine capable of booting from a uh, USB memory stick? If that's okay, then please understand the trade-offs as we discussed. Then implement with great care. You really have to be careful because typos can, well, basically destroy your data if you um, choose um, the wrong device node, so really take your time with the implementation. And then you also have to um, maintain the whole thing. If you do a system upgrade, you have to do a lot of work to really keep it up to date. And last thing, really understand what does it actually protect and what does it not. So um, study these things carefully that we have discussed. Yeah, maybe we have some time for Q&A. Yeah. Um. If, you, um, if you compare this with um, things like loop IIS or things like that, you, I, I think that the log file is a constant symmetric cipher, and you need an asymmetric cipher to um, decipher the log, the symmetric cipher that uh, ciphers your disk. Actually, is it? Uh, do I understand it right, or is it something different? I'm sorry, can you repeat the last sentence? Um, okay, or I will, we will ask another way. Normally you have a symmetric cipher, maybe IS or something, and you have a key for this. And this key is encrypted with another key with asymmetric cipher, and um, the key file is stored somewhere. And I understand it, and I understood this in the way that the log file is the symmetric cipher that is encrypted by an asymmetric cipher. Is it correct? Well, um, the whole GBD thing is quite complex and I haven't really got into um, the details of the implementation. But um, the log file is certainly not the master key. The log file, as I understand it, is um, one part of, um, of the hash of the passphrase. Um, if I'm informed correctly, um, the passphrase is hashed with a SHA-512 bit cipher. And then um, the log file is one part of that 512 bits. And this is used to locate um, the master key on the disk somewhere. But, but the master key has to be encrypted on the disk, otherwise you would easily compromise it. 
Well, if you're interested in the details of GPD, um, then I suggest to read Paul Hanningkamp's paper. Um, I really don't know the details of how the whole thing is programmed and organized. The design of GPD is quite complex. You just have to remember that you need the log file to get access to the master key which is stored on the hard disk. Obviously, it's encrypted, but I can't tell you um, the details. You really have to read Paul Henningkamp's paper for that. Okay, we have to finish now from in favor for the next workshop. Maybe you can just uh, answer two questions outside.